I'm Antonio Vergari. I'm a postdoc at University of California, Los Angeles, in the Star AI lab. And first of all, thanks for the invitation at the UCL, like UCL AI Center. Thanks to Pasquale Minervini for proposing me to do this talk. Thanks to Sara for organizing this. And um, this talk is going to be like, it's going to, um, it's going to start from this iClear paper we got this year. And this is like a joint work with Parta, Mehdi, Bernard, and, um, and Michael. So this is like um, skeptical inquiry of variational autoencoders. And uh, even before getting like into details, I would like to, to motivate the setting and to have like, uh, to build a little bit of background such that we are all on the same, on the same page. So, as usual in machine learning, we start with a bunch of samples. They might be images or some rows in your data sets, and we do assume them to be, uh, to have been like independently drawn from the same distribution. And this distribution is like this P star. And if we have access to this P star, we could solve potentially all tasks in machine learning. This is like the holy grail of machine learning. But we generally do not have access to this P star. We just have like the samples drawn from P stars, IID drawn from P stars. So the aim of the learning phase is to learn an estimator, P theta, that it's gonna approximate our P star. We want to approximate that such that later on at inference time, we are able to um, perform inference. So for instance, to draw new samples from this estimator, this P theta, or maybe uh, try to compute or even approximate approximately compute some queries uh, from this estimator. So in the paradigm of generative modeling, which is like quite popular, popular nowadays, and goes under the name of deep generative modeling, uh, because we are using like neural nets to, to, to model like this estimator, this PTDA, we really are interested in collecting like samples from this estimator. This estimator is gonna act as a sort of like simulator that's like the meaning of like this generative model. Once we have that, we can draw these samples. And once we have with samples, we can like maybe use them for downstream tasks like an answer classifier or perform like uh, approximate form of, of inference. So this deep generative modeling paradigm is quite popular and has been popularized by models like generative adversarial networks, for instance. But in this talk, I'm gonna I'm going to focus on the alternative like family of models, which is like the antagonist of GANs. And this is like variational autoencoders or VAEs. So variational autoencoders are very popular on generative modeling for generative modeling, even though they might be used also for other kinds of tasks like density estimation. It is trying to use like this estimator to capture the density of the model and try to answer like probabilistic queries out of that or disentanglement. That is like trying to learn a latent space, a latent representation of your original, da original data, such that you, the, the factors are somehow like independent, then you can manipulate them and control them independently. And in, in this talk, I'm gonna focus at least for the very first part on generative modeling per se. So generative modeling for VAEs has, has been like extensively researched. And there are lots of lots of like that there is a huge body of literature about this. In this talk, by first focusing on like generative modeling, I would like to claim that many of the ingredients of VAEs can be like removed from this architecture. And we can add like a simplified model, which turns out to be like a deterministic autoencoder, a simple autoencoder, plus some regularization of some kind. And I'm gonna claim that if we focus just on generative modeling, the simpler alternative, which essentially reduces to some architecture that has been also studied, but let's say 10 years ago, in the focus um, under, under the lens of just like the deterministic code encoding, can prove to be like equivalently good or even better when it comes to generative modeling, which means like getting like equivalently good or better samples or equivalently good or, or even smoother latent spaces. So this might sound a little bit like, a, it might sound like a huge claim. So in essence, I'm saying like that 
some models, maybe from 10 years ago, can still be useful nowadays for, for a very popular paradigm uh, in machine learning. So um, I've learned from Twitter that I'm gonna be fine if I just say that this is like controversial opinion and I put a sort of like a hashtag. So I'm not gonna have like any kind of like drawbacks. Um, what I really want to do is like to engage like in a discussion about like what are like the model and the, the, the design rules we apply nowadays in research in machine learning. And I'm gonna claim like we, we can have like, we can find great value and try to revisit like old ideas and also try to simplify very sophisticated and complicated ideas. Try to see like what's the core, what's really important behind the models we are using nowadays. So um, feel free to uh, interrupt me at any time here on Zoom to ask questions or also feel free to like to ask questions uh, afterwards, even when the recording has stopped. All right, so let's begin. So I'm gonna try to uh, show you what VAEs are. I'm gonna give like this step-by-step -step or block-by-block -block introduction. So variational autoencoder comprises, in essence, three modules. So the first one is like the encoder. The objective of the encoder is like to take like some input sample, let's say it's one of your images, and then to map that to a distribution, this Q5, also called the posterior distribution. So in essence, we are mapping like one point in the input space to a distribution in this latent space, which is Z. Once I have this distribution, this posterior, which might be modeled by a simple Gaussian distribution, conditional Gaussian, for instance, was mean and variance, however, are, let's say, um, are the output of a sophisticated neural network, which is like this block here, this P of phi, then we can sample from this distribution. And let's say we sample a code, one code this Z, then we can use this code to feed the second module in our architecture, which is called the decoder, here indicated as D of theta. And D of theta takes one sample in the latent space, a latent code, and maps that to another distribution. And this distribution now has like support on the original space, which is the image. So we are modeling this P of theta of X given Z. So we can sample from this distribution, which again can be another Gaussian was mean and um, variance or covariance can be like modeled by another neural net. And when we sample, we can obtain like more images of this kind. So these are like the two main blocks. To see like what's the third block, we need to, to see like how do we would like to train this architecture. So ultimately, we would like to learn both the parameters of the encoder and the decoder. So. If we look at the VAE from like a perspective of a generative model, it's like a mixture model with like continuous latent variables Z, and therefore it's like a mixture model with an infinite and uncountable number of components. We cannot compute the likelihood, which we would like usually maximize, um, ideally in a maximum likelihood framework. And this goes under the name of marginal likelihood because it's just like the log of P of theta of X. We're marginalizing out the latent variable Z. What we can do is, however, um, trying to maximize a lower bound for this. And this is like the evidence lower bound or elbow in short. So this is like the elbow depicted um, at the bottom here. And it comprises like two terms. The first term goes under the name of like reconstruction error sometimes. And we're gonna see why this, this terminology is like correctly uh, taken from like the classical autoencoder uh, nomenclature. And this reconstruction term essentially tells like an expectation if you draw many samples from the Zs, we would like um, to, to maximize this log P of X given Z. And the other term is like the KL term, um, the kubak liver divergence between like our posterior Q of phi and another object which is called the prior. So this prior in essence dictates what's the structure in the latent space. It's usually taken to be like a very simple distribution. Let's say just like a standard Gaussian such that we can sample from that. We want to sample from this uh, because we want to use like a VE as a generative model. In a couple of slides I'm gonna show you how to do this. But in essence think 
about this Kia term so far for now as a sort of a regularizer. When you want to come every uh, posterior associated to every input sample X and going through one encoder to, to conform to this, to, to this space. You want to put some structure in the space. You want the space to be also compact in a sense. So training VAEs amounts of like um, optimizing the elbow, as I said, and it has like quite, it, it, it is theoretically baked from several perspectives. However, there are many, many works recently that are showing like one issue or another into this process. So it seems like there is lots of effort trying to also fix a little bit of like the theory when the theory detaches from the practice. Because in practice, many of the things that we expect like to see, like having like a uh, good, um, a well-behaved optimization or trying like to um, have a latent cause that are quite informative do not always happen in practice. So there is a bunch of literature that tries to, um, that highlights these issues and tries to collect this, uh, correct these issues. Um, we're building over this, like uh, building upon this rich literature. And I'm gonna talk about two points in particular uh, in this talk, two issues that are gonna like inspire us to look into more depth. So the first one is trying to balance like the reconstruction quality and the compression effects of the um, over the latent spaces. So back to the elbow and back to the way we train VAEs. So if we look at the first term, which is like the reconstruction term, we can see like that we have an expectation there. We would like to take multiple samples of Z and feed that to the decoder to have a good approximation for that expectation which means essentially doing like a good like Monte Carlo estimate of that, uh, of that pesky integral there. However, this would require that the, um, in the way in the training routine we have for VAEs that at every step for every input sample, we should draw many Zs and we should like compute that term. This should, can in practice hinder like the training procedure. So what people do in, in practice is just to have like one sample approximation. So for every input X, they just have like a single point, not a bunch of points drawn from like the posterior QZ given X. And then they use just single point and usually apply this reparameterization trick to get like, to optimize um, the, the, the weights of the, of the encoder. Um, so it's, it's quite clear that if we just get like one sample of Z, we're not like letting the decoder see many of the points um, around, around that. And um, the quality of the reconstruction might be hindered. At the same time, there is like a tension in the elbow um, for VAEs. And this tension basically says that we have to be very careful when we try to balance like the reconstruction with a KL, which tells us in, in essence how well um, how homogeneous and how well structured, how simple the latent space should be. So what people do in practice is like to put a coefficient in front of this KL term, sometimes called beta, and this like names like the, the, the beta VAE model out of this. And annealing this beta or just like figuring out sensible values for these beta coefficients it's like key into optimizing this model's world because sometimes one term might, might overrule the other during optimization. So if the K term overrules, then we can have like uh, quite blurry samples, for instance, if all our samples are images. So there is like this tension here. And in practice, you really need to, to tweak your hyperparameters because like you're dealing with stochastic encoders and decoders even if in practice, as we started to see for the, for the encoder, we are taking just one sample and not considering the full distribution for each iteration. So this is like the, the first issue. We're gonna see like later if we can do something from here. But before talking about the second issue, which is like the mismatch between the prior and the aggregate posterior, I would like to recap how do we sample from VAEs? How do we use VAEs as generative models? 
So remember, we have this object here, which is our prior, our PZ, which can be like an isotropic Gaussian over the latent spaces. So we can definitely and easily draw samples from that. Let's say we draw some samples from this like isotropic Gaussian. Then we just feed these samples through the decoder and we obtain like a new distribution. Then we can sample from this distribution to obtain like objects. And this is like a degenerative model inside the VAE. So what's the issue in here? Well, think about this. During training, we have like forced the encoder and the decoder to look at each other, right? So for each sample X, we produced like a posterior distribution Q of Z given X, which is like this blue blob that I'm trying to overlapping to, to the prior. Then for another sample, we're gonna get like another distribution. The encoder is stochastic indeed. And we're gonna map to another blob there, so on and so forth. So ideally, what we call the aggregated posterior, which should be like a sort of like Q of Z after we marginalize out all the X's should match our prior, right? If this happens, everything is fine. We can sample from PZ and we're gonna sample from all the points that D has observed during training. However, in practice, this is never the case. You can try to, to train like a VAE after you have carefully balanced like reconstruction and the KL term. And you might find by visualizing like some embedding, your embedding spaces, maybe by some projection, that the points maybe in your training or even test data um, are getting mapped by the, the encoder to some regions of the latent space. And overall, these regions aggregated together are not really matching matching like your prior. This is called the prior aggregate posterior mismatch and has been observed several times in the literature. So how do people deal with this? So essentially they're gonna add like a couple um, new terms into like your, your objective that you are like optimizing in your elbow and these are trying to say that maybe what you want is not a KL between like the posterior and of a single single sample and the prior, maybe you want like yeah between the aggregate posterior and the prior. So you're trying to optimize for this, right? But even after adding these terms, you can have like a mismatch because you're adding new term in your objective, and then you have balanced have to balance three terms, for instance. To see why this mismatch between the aggregate posterior and the prior is not the best, try to, to consider this. Suppose that at inference time we sample we want to use the VAE as a generative model. And we sample some, some codes from the prior, from our isotropic Gaussian. But we are getting like some points in the space that have never been seen by the decoder so far. What's the result? The result is like that the outputs decoded by the decoder can be arbitrarily bad somehow. So we really would like to avoid this. So these are like the two issues I've uh, described so far. So having stochasticity somehow implies that optimization gets harder and we have to be very careful in balancing like the different terms of our elbow. At the same time, we still have like this mismatch of like the ideal structure of the latent space, this fixed a priori prior distribution and the true um, aggregated like distribution that we get in the latent space, this aggregated posterior. So can we do better? Can we try to solve these this two issues? And the answer is that partially or unconsciously, maybe at least the, per the first issue has been dealt with by people. And this is the interesting part. And this also like highlights how like theory and practice somehow like take different routes sometimes. So there, there, oops, there is some feedback. Can you hear my voice? No, it seems fine so far. Okay, sorry. So back to the our architecture for a standard VAE and its standard loss below. That's the loss of the VAE. I just like inverted signs just because we, we want it's, uh, to write it as a loss. We want to minimize it. Okay, so we have this like two stochastic encoder and decoder pairs. What if we make that deterministic? 
they're not mapping points to distributions, they're just mapping points to points. So one point X gets mapped by the encoder to a single point, a single latent code in the latent space, and a single latent code in the latent space gets mapped by the decoder, a single uh, point in the, in the input space back again. So what happens if we try to do this? Well, for sure, the reconstruction term now really reduces to the, the usual reconstruction, which can be like a mean root square um, error, for instance, a mean squared error, sorry, um, for normal autoencoders, like in this case, um, or it could be like cross entropy if our inputs are like um, discrete. And um, now we do not need to deal with like that pesky ex expectation anymore, right? We do not need even a reparameterization trick. So it's quite simplified, it seems, right? And this also follows from the observation that in practice, people, in a sense, were already doing this, like taking a single step, a uh, single Z. They were also trying to constrain the variances of their like stochastic encoder and decoders up to the point that those variances were like disappearing, were not playing a role. They were also doing this in many works for the decoder. So it seems like we are making like no harm doing this. So this is like the first simplification, making the encoder and decoder um, deterministic and not stochastic. What happens to the KEL term then? Well, we do not have like a notion of prior in the latent space anymore, right? That doesn't make any sense so far. So we, we can just get rid of that. However, to have like um, better like um, well-behaved optimization, we would like the encoder to put latent codes not arbitrarily far in the space, but somehow in a constrained space. So we can add to our loss, we can add back like a norm or something that just like tells us that the latent codes should be like in some restricted region of the space. Note that you can also achieve this if like the last layer of your um, encoder contains, let's say, maybe some nonlinearity like um, hyperbolic tangent or like sigmoid constraining like somehow naturally or like less naturally your um, latent codes. Then if we look at like how the input gets mapped um, in the latent space, we're still gonna have like, let's say, different clouds of points, possibly. What I want to say is like, we do not have like a prior and fixed a priori structure imposed by our isotropic Gaussian, our um, prior distribution um, th that before was like a design, uh, was colored in orange. Instead, we are still like limiting, like let's say the overall volume, but all the samples are free to get like mapped in different regions of the space. So I can hear some skepticism here. Essentially, people will say like, yeah, but in this way, we are like having a latent space which is full of holes. We're not like trying to, to collapse all the posterior distributions or all the codes to some, some, some homogeneous region. How do, we, how do we do, how would we deal with this? Well, in a sense, what we would like to achieve is that the decoder is always able to, to decode something. Even if like we perceive to be uh, to, to do some gaps in the in the latent space, so ideally, if I move like the z some, some codes a little bit in the latent space, I would like that output of the decoder is not going to change that much, right? In essence, to have like a smooth latent space, ideally, I would like to have like a smooth decoder. So how to achieve this? But, well, in practice, we can just add another like term, which acts as uh, yet another regularizer, but this time it's a regularizer over like the decoder to make it smooth. This pops up a question, which kind of regularization can we use for like our rates? Rates um, are just like this very simplified version of like autoencoders, which we name regularized autoencoder to pay um, homage to to, to the previous literature of, of autoencoders as well. So which kind of regularization, which kind of form for this loss, this last term, this L reg? So if you think about like that uh, criteria, that desiderata that we wouldn't have like the decoder to be smooth, ideally 
we would like to place some penalty over the gradients of the, of the decoder. So this goes under the name of gradient penalization in the generative adversarial network literature. And we can have a look at all, all other kinds of regularization schemes from like the GANs literature because their like regularization is really a hot topic. Another like possibility is for, from that body of literature is like spectral normalization. We would like like the weights of the decoder to have like spectral norm of one, for instance. This would like enforce the smoothness of the of the of the decoder. Um, but striving for simplicity, just like an L2 norm or a form of like weight decay could do the job. So we show also in the paper that applying this weight decay as it's it's essentially like very analogous to doing the reparameterization trick when you were like using like stochastic encoders and decoders but just using like a single sample or the expectation in the reconstruction term. This is because like weight decay in essence is shown to be by Bishop um, somehow equivalent to inject a little amount of noise to the inputs of the decoder. That was what the reparameterization trick was doing. Um, feel free to ask questions or I'm also open to like have like offline discussions about this later. So let's say we pick like the simplest, the simplest kind of like regularization L2 over the weights of the decoder. And then we have like this deterministic architecture, this rays, regularized those encoders. How good are they? How good are like their samples or their um, interpolations in latent space? Are we really having a lot of smooth latent space? And then we have like not smooth latent space by some errors from like Google's, Google Slides. Then let me try to see. Okay, so here I would like to show you some interpolations in latent space. On the left, those from uh, VAE with the same architecture, those for all the regularized autoencoder with L2 regularization on the on the right. And hope you can see this. They are like equivalently smooth. And what might even argue that rays are like slightly better quality. Uh, wise. Even if like to make this presentation in high dimensions, like these samples, which are from this data set, Celebay, which many of you might know, have been like enlarged quite a lot. This is why on top of the blurriness, which comes from the L2 reconstruction loss, we are adding this additional blurriness plus com the conversion to video. But this is like to show you that just by putting this L2, we can have like some samples and interpolation between these samples that are somehow equivalently good. At the same time, a very skeptical person might ask like, what happens that? What's really the effect of this regularization? To see that we should like train a model without any regularization at all. We should be like a classic, plain, good old uh, autoencoder. And oops, again, I guess it's the video getting like quite and for this reason we are really trying to do this so this is like a comparison between the same VAEs before a regularized autoencoder equipped with L2 regularization and an autoencoder without the additional regularization term and the surprise is that even without regularization there is like some out of smoothness and traversing this latent space can be done in an equivalently good um, in currently good way. So this might mean that there might be some like implicit regularization going on in this in this regard. And I, I will be back on this kind of topics later. So for now, let me show you something else. Let me show you like a more systematic comparison of some like standard image benchmarks, like the classical MNIST, which is like the simplest case. And we're comparing like VAEs, constrained variance VAEs, vestige time, autoencoders, two-stage VAEs, and lots of like variations with different terms of the regularization um, in, a, in a sort of like autopsy of like the loss of VAEs to try to understand like what's, what's going on here. And we can see that both for reconstructions, random samples, and interpolations, there is not much difference, but actually all the Ray models by the the, the last uh, rows of this table are performing quite good, 
And um, even better than the other model, um, this is like qualitatively and also quantitatively. If we measure like the FIDs of the generated samples, for instance, this happens on MNIST, happens also on Cypher 10, also happens on Celebay, where it's much clearer how like smoother are the interpolations of a regularized autoencoder. So um, I would have expect some someone asking like, okay, okay some, some feedbacks, maybe someone is actually asking something. Is it? Maybe Hello? Not. Hi. Hi, yes. Um, I had a question about the, I don't think you mentioned the adversarial autoencoders and how does the smoothness of the latent space there compares to um, I, that of your model? Right, so you're mentioning like adversarial autoencoders. So in that case, they have like an additional way uh, to put like, to construct the loss, which is like by doing, by playing an adversarial game, right? So if I'm not mistaken, um, adversarial autoencoder or like AAE have been like found to be like less good than Wasserstein autoencoders, right? Um, so I'm not sure how they compare to the Wasserstein. I know that when they were compared to the uh, plain variational autoencoders, they're essentially, yes, using a discriminator and they've shown to have a better smoothness in the latent space. Um, it, is, it is true. You have to pay a price, however, in that case first. And that price is not that, that small. So first of all, you have to play like with adversarial learning and all the issues there. So um, the idea is that if you have like the loss of a VAE, generally you're trying to say like, oh, this is even better than like playing like the same game as GANs, right? You, it's better to have like just a min optimization than a min max optimization. We have also kind of issues like for the min max there. And in this case, we are even simplifying like the optimization problem over the AE. So in a sense, um, you definitely get like better quality than VAEs with like adversarial autoencoders, but uh, optimization is much trickier, much trickier in that case. Then I can tell you that I might be wrong, but I think like it was in the paper of the Wasserstein autoencoder that they showed that they were better than adversarial autoencoders. Okay. Does it make a sense? So Wasserstein autoencoder is yet another simplification in this direction. And you can think about this like an even more extreme simplification in a case, or if you want like a simpler general scheme. Okay. Does this answer your question somehow? Yeah, and I just had one more question. Uh, just um, I might have missed on one of the slides, but how are you sampling from the latent space in your? I case? was I was waiting for this dramatic moment because I I showed you like samples, but I just showed you like the deterministic encoder and decoder pair, right? How do we sample from this? So here's the catch. So I uh, said a little lie before. And these little lights that you you cannot use just rays as they are, as generative models, you need like an extra ingredient for this. So this is like the learned um, latent space of a ray, of a regularized dot encoder, right? There is like no imposed structure, and however the space uh, is moved, as I should by, by, by samples. How do we sample from this? Well, we just do like good old fashioned density estimation after we have trained like our model. We call this step like X post density estimation or short term XPDE. So you can fit like a simple density estimator that's gonna recover like your aggregate posterior. So this Q of lambda of Z, it's our estimator for the aggregate posterior. Once we have that as usual, we just like need to sample from this model. We get a new code, new Z new in this like estimated aggregated posterior, we fit that to the decoder and the decoder is going to produce like a new, um, a new sample. So in essence, if the decoder is smooth and if the latent space is smoothed, this and if the density estimation step is like accurate enough, we're going to get like good samples out of this. Does it make sense? Yep, thank you. Thanks. Okay. So, question, can we just do like XPDs for VAEs as well? 
So this simple step, which is like density estimation after um, learning the codes can also be applied to VEs and this can ameliorate or solve in a somehow like um, better way, like the, the, the mismatch between the, the aggregated posterior in VAEs and all kinds of variants like Wasserstein autoencoders as well, even two stages VAEs so on and so forth. So the answer is yes, we can, we can do this. Also for that. Um, but now the question is like, which kind of density estimator shall we use for this kind of thing? So people would claim nowadays that we should use like a state of the art deep generative model, like the, the biggest other aggressive model we have so far, maybe a pixel CNN or the biggest like normalizing flow or even another VAE. So people might use another VAE to estimate like the um, aggregated posterior for uh, a simple VAE. We're not gonna solve however all the issues we had uh, before. Maybe we're gonna ameliorate them, but even for the second VAE we're gonna get into trouble. Again, we are striving for simplicity. So instead of these alternatives, we're gonna aim for a very simple like density estimator, like a mixture of Gaussians. And this also proves our point that if the latent space is smooth enough, you do not need like much to estimate like this component. So we just used like a Gaussian mixture model with 10 components. And it's very easy to sample from this. It's very easy to fit this model. And uh, you, you can fit that really in a, in a breeze with very little overhead by, by running yeah expectation um, maximization. Um, so in this context here, uh, I would also like try to make a point why it's also better to avoid like more complicated models. Suppose that your latent space is smooth, but it's not smooth enough. And suppose like that your density estimator just places delta of Dirac's over all the latent codes from your training samples. You're gonna, you're gonna go sample from this like, uh, if you apply like the um, array, the outputs of your like decoder, the samples, the new samples you're gonna generate are gonna just be like copies of your training samples. You're gonna just memorize like your training set. So it's not really helpful to have like a model that really overfit like the, the latent space. Instead, what you want is like a very simple that's the estimator and a smooth enough latent space. The combination of the two provides like the better generalization. So as I asked before, can we just do like XPD or v VAEs? And indeed the answer is yes. So if we go like to the qualitative, sorry, quantitative experiments that we did on MNIS, Cypher and Celebi, we have like some of like the numerous variants of VAEs we compared in our paper and we measure like the quality of like generated random samples in terms of the FID or precision and recall of every other kind of metric you want to compare like your sample, the quality of the sample generated by your deep generative model. You can see that if you apply XPDE on those models and you just use a simple like Gaussian mixture model with 10 components, the FD, FIDs of like your, your samples are gonna improve all the time for like competitors. So XPDE really is like a practical solution, very little overhead for all these kinds of like VAE models. So, so that's good. Um, but I can hear like some skepticism. It, it, it seems like too good to be true, right? Why does it work in the first place? And we should really ask like, why does it work? And try to perform like an even like deeper autopsy of this kind of loss. So. Um, my friend maybe will say like that this worked because like common nets are just very smooth. I would like to add that these data sets are also very full of regularities. Very, very full of regularities. Like these faces like Celebay, we have like pretty much all the images where eyes, nose, and mouths are being aligned. And this provides like lots of structure to be captured by these autoencoders. So one can say like these are somehow easy data sets. So what about like more complicated settings? What about like more challenging data like molecules or structured objects? There is a rich literature about using VAEs for molecules and for graphs in general. One of the, the, the earliest um, is the, like the module VAE, molecule VAE, sorry. Then we have like the grammar VAE, constraint graph VAEs and many, many, many more. So we take just one of this as a sort of competitor and baseline, the grammar VAE or GVAE. And we show that you can take like 
a GVAE, and you can turn that into a grammar regularized out encoder. You can reify the grammar GVAE. And if you do so, you're going to also improve like on the quality of the generated molecules in this case. So how do you reify your VAE? That's quite simple. That's just like repeating the steps I showed you before. And this can turn out like in modifying your codes if you're using like, let's say, TensorFlow or PyTorch or any other like library, just like modify maybe like four to, to, to six lines of code. So in the first place, you have to replace the reconstruction term into like our mean squared error term. And most of the times, if you look at the code, it's already like there because you are considering implicitly like encoders uh, and decoders to, to be like either deterministic or to have like constrained variance. The other part is just like to replace the KL term by having like some, some constraint over the space or the Zs and plus adding a regularizer. And if the regularizer is weight decay, really takes no time to reify your, your VAE. So this is, this is it. This is like basically the introduction to this part of the talk. I'm gonna use like the last minutes to question if this is really that simple. This is really like all new ideas. So it turns out that autoencoders, classical deterministic autoencoders have been like used for generative model, modeling a lot in the past. So there are like very seminal works by Refi and by, by Banjo and colleagues where they were using like denoising autoencoders or contractive autoencoders. And they are like forms of like regularized autoencoders. The way they, they were used for generative modeling, however, was not by performing ex post density estimation on the latent codes by, by devising some very clever Markov chain Monte Carlo schemes to sample from there. So they were using the corruption process between like the encoder and the decoder to build like a Markov chain and then sample out of that. This more sophisticated idea, however, like has some limitations. So like MCMC uh, struggles in high dimensional spaces, which the, the latent codes can still be and more importantly like have issues like converging so xpd can be like a simpler alternative a much simpler alternative with this regard there also have been like different flavors of xpde ex post density estimation one of this is like this two-stage vae sorry for instance so the two-stage vae builds first a vae and then trains to learn a second vae to estimate better the aggregate posterior as i mentioned before this really is like reusing and refacing all the training and sampling issues. To my have the VA in the first stage on the second stage. And we tried that in our experiments and it also like not, it's, it's quite tricky to optimize. Um, the other case is like using really one of the state of the art autoregressive model like a pixel CNN on a latent space that now it's discretized if we want quantized taken from like code book of like discrete latent variables. And this is like like the popular VQVAE invariants, like VQVAE2 model. And it's quite remarkable that VQVAEs are not variational, are not stochastic, and they're not VAEs, despite the name. But in the literature, we are like embrace them uh, as VAEs. And these were like the best VAEs so far. Um, let's say up to uh, two weeks ago, when another like VAE model a hierarchical VAE model came, came out. And the fun fact is that VQVAEs are just like um, deterministic VAEs. And um, they share the same limitation of race, and we're gonna talk about them in a minute. So up to this point, really seems to be gained a lot, like in simplicity, easiness of training, like quality of samples, and like smoothness in the latent space. So we must have must have lost something, right? There must be a trade-off. Where's the catch? So if you remember, I told you at the beginning that variational autoencoders are not only used as generative models, even if like the 95% of like the works use them to generate samples. They can be used still as like density estimators or even for disentanglement. Can we also use rays for density estimation and disentanglement? That's the question. And the answer is that maybe yes, maybe not. There are some works that are really like very recent and they're trying to push like race for like, for these other two uh, possible tasks. 
why, why is this like difficult? So for this estimation, uh, rays do not have like an elbow anymore. So we do not have like an explicit likelihood model. It's implicit because we just have a likelihood over the latent space, but then the decoder is deterministic. This is like essentially like the, the, the generator of a GAN, right? So rays, but also like the QVAs are just like GANs. They are implicit likelihood models. So we cannot have like a lower bound for the marginal log likelihood. However, some very recent works, which are quite impressive by um, some people at Google, at, um, at the New York University, uh, trying to recover what seems like to be an elbow by trying to interpret like the decoder as a sort of like, it's definitely not a bijection, can be like an uh, injective transformation. So it, you can have like locally a sort of a flow and by having this flow and by making some geometric assumption of the manifold of your latent spaces, you can recover some, some, some form of elbow of lower bound. This is like very recent and super interesting direction. You can go there, much is still to be, to be um, discovered and investigated in this sense. For what's like a disentanglement, I cannot say really much. I'm not an expert in disentanglement myself, and I struggle sometimes to really disentangle all the definitions of disentanglement. No joke, no real joke here. Um, but there are like very recent works also in this like direction where people try to add to the loss of a regularized autoencoder the same very same terms they were adding to the previous losses of VAE, like having like a total correlation uh, penalization term, for instance, try to have like the single dimensions of the latent code to be like independent or mostly independent one from another to try to, to, to achieve like this entanglement. So I think like I reached like, I used mostly all my time, we still have a couple of time, I'm reaching like conclusions. So to conclude, to recap what I showed you here, um, let me let me just use another cartoon, another metaphor. So I know lots of people, lots of friends who uh, need for a phone and they use these AI phones and they have like, they are very good for like, they have super, super nice phone capabilities. They have very, very good like connectivity and the ability to send messages, you can talk and the audio is very nice. Moreover, they can also be um, offer you nice additional capabilities like the full integration with the AI ecosystem. We have AI clouds, you can use them with your AI watch so on so forth. Plus they have astonishing like cameras and you can shoot videos in 4K, super high definitions and things like that. So many of my friends need a phone, they just go on the market and they get an AI phone it's because everyone uses like an AI phone. But most of the time, you just need to do the phone for its like audio capabilities and just need to make calls and would like the calls to be like as sharp as like possible and just want like to send messages so maybe they don't really need an ai phone they really like a regular phone it's gonna provide like much simpler experience for phone capabilities is it true that however it's not integrated with an ai cloud and 4k videos it's like out of its scope so I would like with this intuition pump, even if put at the end, just like prompt the fact that we can strive for simplicity and get back like a couple years and get to simpler models that got like um, a little bit out of the radar, off the radar from the current research. And they're gonna provide something, something, something useful, quite useful, I would say. Um, so takeaway number one, if you have a VAE, and you're using VAEs for generative modeling and you're just interested in generating samples, you can simplify maybe some of the parts of your pipeline. You can reify your VAEs. And this can be simple. Just replace likelihood extraction loss with a mis square error or cross entropy, a simple loss, or end the KL term with the regularization terms. And then you have like um, race. Even if you can't, for instance, you can still apply exposed density estimation to your VAEs and you're gonna boost the quality of your samples and your interpolations. And that's gonna that's gonna be like useful, I hope. Oh, one question, so, is that the um, FID, mm -hmm. the fresh inception distance? Yes, 
yes. in the table? Yes, in the table, yeah, okay, that's thanks. the FID. And in the paper, we also show like precision and recall in the sense, like not in the sense of like imbalanced classification, but in the sense of like the two metrics for like uh, assessing the quality of generative models. And um, these are, I think, like the most prominent ways to assess the quality. There are like arguably better scores for some other kinds of scenarios, but that's it. So I think I, I I reached like the last slide. Thanks for questions. Thanks.